what's up? Welcome to the second show for the Landlords Connect Philadelphia podcast. Today we're going to be talking about a really, really interesting topic that everybody has questions on. It's a constant conversation on the the group and something that is probably the biggest sore point for landlords in Philadelphia, evictions. Um, we have a really, really special guest. Um, before I introduce him, I just wanted to talk a little bit, uh, give some general information about evictions, um, some interesting facts about evictions in our region. The state of Pennsylvania enacted a strong eviction moratorium that extended until August 31st of 2020. Eviction filings related to non-payment of rent were not accepted during that period. And filings in Philadelphia County were down to zero in April, May, and June of 2020. Filings increased following the end of the moratorium. Execution of eviction orders were generally banned until at least May 16th of 2021. I'm sure you guys all remember that period where there was, um, you know, when COVID first started and then the talk of the moratorium and then the implementation of the moratorium, which is actually why I started the Landlords Connect Philadelphia group because I personally was freaking out about whether or not I would be able to collect rent and started the group and we all helped each other get through that. I think it um, was uh, one of the toughest times in history maybe to be a landlord. Um, starting in April, 2021, Philadelphia landlords were required to participate in the city's eviction diversion program before filing for eviction for non-payment of rent. Um, back in January of 2020, there was an average of about 2,000 eviction filings a month. Obviously that went down to zero when there was a moratorium. And today it's back up to somewhere between 1,200 and 1,700 evictions per month. So without further ado, um, so to discuss this really important and complex issue, I want to introduce you to Howard Ford. Howard is the owner of Evictions Unlimited, He's a seasoned real estate attorney with more than 30 years of experience as a lawyer and real estate investor himself. He began his legal career as an assistant district attorney in Montgomery County, and he practiced in the litigation department at a firm with more than 200 lawyers. He launched his own practice in 2004 and is the owner of Evictions Unlimited, a company devoted to assisting lawyers in Philadelphia and the surrounding counties. Howard has been a real estate investor since his senior year of college when he and his roommate purchased their first duplex. He currently owns numerous properties throughout the region and understands firsthand the issues facing landlords. So I can't think of a better person to talk to us about evictions and finally get the final word on what are the rules, what are the major problems, and what we all need to know about evictions. So thank you so much, Howard, for, for being willing to join me here and spend your time and to share your great wealth of knowledge. Hi, Cheryl. Um, good morning. Thank you for morning. allowing me to participate. So let me turn it over to you. If you could just tell us a bit about how you got started and how your journey brought you to this point. It's a long one. I'm older than I look. Um, back in college, my roommate and I were pretty practical people and we didn't want to pay rent when we graduated. So we came up with the idea to go to real estate school, become agents, learn how to buy and sell property so that we could have enough knowledge in order to be able to buy one. We did that. We were 21 years old. We bought a duplex in Northeast Philly. We had this wonderful idea that we could still be roommates, live in half of the building and rent the other half. The rent was enough to basically cover the mortgage and we almost lived for free. From there, uh, girlfriends made the place too small we upgraded to a row home around the corner. And then I met my wife, we moved in, he moved out, and then uh, we just continued to buy. You have to remember at the time we were buying, interest rates were probably where they are now, around the 6% mark, but you could buy a property for 5% down 
And so for a couple thousand bucks, we could buy a property. It could be a second home. We had a lot of second homes and uh, the portfolio grew as equity allowed. We would refi, pull out some cash, buy the next one. And we kept going. Then if you remember the chronology of events, um, New Yorkers decided that Philadelphia was a really cheap place to buy real estate. Everybody always blames New Yorkers. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what happened is uh, back then, MLS was still in its infancy in the computer system, and it was still the book. You had to look things up. Then you had to have your maps, your Yahoo maps. You had to print them out. There was no GPS. And we would go around with uh, a realtor on the weekend. We'd look at 10 or 12 places and get outbid on everything. The prices started to get to the point where the um, the rents weren't supporting the debt anymore. You know, the prices had gone up so far, it became a hot potato. This is the beginning of the end for the housing market where everybody's buying and selling based on equity and not cash flow. So we took a pause at that point. Little babies started popping up in our lives and we had less time to devote to actively being investors. So we held some things, we sold some things. In the meantime, I'm in the DA's office. I leave the DA's office. I start the, the law firm practice. That becomes incredibly difficult given the nature of the age of my kids and wanting to see them at night. So uh, while this was all going on, I was going to a lot of settlements. I was meeting a lot of property managers. I was meeting a lot of title company agents and realtors and everybody else. And they all said they had a need. Everybody needed a lawyer. So I thought that was the prime time for me to pull the trigger on the big firm life, start a small practice for myself and work all this real estate stuff while continuing to buy. Then, ironically, I needed an eviction. I needed one for one of my own properties. And I thought, I now have the time to figure this out. I don't need to hire anybody. I don't need to talk to anybody. And I went down to where they were at the time, which was like, 34 South 11th. What, when, what year, about what year is this? Uh, early 2000s, 2004, 2005. And I discovered how the process worked. And then at that time, if you needed a rental license, that was about it. You didn't need a certificate. You didn't need a lead test. You didn't have to worry about community legal services. You showed up with a lease you said you had a license and you got a court date. The court date was three weeks later. You went in. The judge would turn to the tenant back in those days and say, did you pay your rent? <laughs> tenant would say no for whatever reason. Judge would say, you have to pay your rent, finding for landlord next case. And it was almost that simple. But no one really knew how to even do that. So just word of mouth and then creating a website back in the early days when there weren't many websites organically helped the business to grow. And, you know, here we are all these years later and we're still doing it. Amazing. It's uh, quite incredible that that's, I, I would have never guessed that that's how you ended up doing this. It's that and, simple. Yeah. And uh, I guess, you know, what am I going to say? It's the, the good old days when things were simple and, and common sense maybe was what was how things operated because today we all can't figure out um, how we ended up here where evicting a tenant who doesn't pay is so difficult and and there's so many rules to follow so much paperwork and um, yeah and you know that's why I wanted to uh, make one of our early episodes for the podcast about evictions because it is such a, a pain point for us today. So how, ma how many evictions do you actually end up handling on a, on a regular basis? It depends. Depends on a number of factors. But to go back to your point of how did we get here, let, let's explore that a little bit more first. How did we get here is continuing that path from the early 2000s, you have to remember now that you have a lot of out-of-town landlords. The, the focus was okay. everybody was coming in. Philly property was cheap and the blocks were being broken. These were World War II era blocks, the Northeast and the surrounding area. And all of those people were aging out. The houses were starting to turn over. 
the the family members didn't want the properties and they were putting them up for sale. Whoever was buying them, whether they were local investors or out of town investors, they were no longer owner occupied homes. And because of that, the care of those homes was different where the days of people sweeping their front yards, sitting out on their porches after dinner and talking to their neighbors was over. And the city was finding that these blocks were now in disrepair and they needed to do something. So early mid 2000s, the city says, we're going to require that L and I inspect every property before it is able to be rented. If you don't have something from L and I saying that you are approved, you will not be able to rent the property. That became an issue and the landlords revolted. They put a pause on that to see how can we make this work. There's so many landlords complaining, there's got to be a fix. And there was litigation involved. Eventually, what came out of that was the certificate of rental suitability. That was a compromise. And that compromise was, all right, look, we understand it's going to be incredibly difficult because l and is understaffed and the time it's going to take to get someone out there to approve it in order to rent it is going to be impossible. Mm. So the idea was if there are no open violations and the city is comfortable saying there's no open violations because they can check their system, then we'll issue this piece of paper that says, all right, the property must be okay because there's no open violations. So I, as a landlord, I'm taking responsibility to say, I know that my property is okay. Partially. Otherwise, okay. Partially, but the certificate, the actual certificate of rental suitability that now every landlord has to give a tenant in the city says to both the city and the tenant, we are unaware of any open violations in your property, which on its simplest level means it, it's okay. It, it's safe enough to live in. Whether it's all true or not, it's a way for the city to at least have some control. And it's a way for the tenant to have some idea that the property is in a decent condition. So from that was born the compromise of the certificate of rental suitability. And that has been alive since 2010, I think it is. Does that essentially put more liability on the owner? Because like I, I work in many areas in the country and there are many where they do have uh, require that there be an inspection. And I kind of like when the city takes it on to do the inspection because they're taking responsibility. They're saying, we were in your place, we reviewed everything, it's safe and, and suitable. Um, whereas in Philadelphia, I'm the one taking that responsibility of saying my property is safe and suitable. I do work in the counties as well. Montgomery County, uh, Delaware County, for sure, have inspectors and they'll come to landlord tenant hearings and they'll say, hey, wait a second, you're not compliant. And I've seen in circumstances out in the counties where they will actually arrest a landlord who's been given opportunity to fix properties doesn't fix them, is called before the court several different times. And I, I've seen people walked out with jail as a potential because they're not complying with what the, the local municipalities want. Philly, based on all of this new fining that they're doing and the rates at which they're fining, they're hiring a lot of people. So we may see in the future that they have enough inspectors to go to every property when it's time to rent. I don't know. That's speculation on my part, but I do know that they are hiring more people on a regular basis. So they're finding more. The clip violations are greater than ever. And, and all the habitability issues are tied into city council who thinks they have a grip on all this. It's a problem. Okay. So could could you just run us through the paperwork that actually landlords are responsible for? Because that rental suitability is just one small part of it. Sure. So if you start at the very beginning when you buy a property, you are not allowed at that point to rent that property in the city of Philadelphia based on the code. So at a minimum to get started, you have to go register as an entity that is doing business in the city, whether you're an individual or a business. 
because you are now doing business with the city and they want to know that. When you're collecting rent, even as a mom and pop, you're collecting income and that's a business. So you have to get the uh, business privilege license or a, uh, what's it called now? The commercial activity license, mm -hmm. which registers you with the city with a city tax number, which will then tie into your NPT, your net profit tax and your BPT, your business profit tax. That then allows you to get a rental license. Now, the city has cracked down on all of that and said, look, you can't get a rental license unless you're tax compliant. So if you owe the city any money for anything, they will not allow you to continue to do business, i.e. get a rental license. Once you get the rental license, that's now up to $63, I think, for January right. 2023, $63 mm -hmm. a unit times however many units you have. And that's good for a year. During that time, you are allowed to rent the property in the city. That doesn't talk about the habitability issues and everything else. That just says you've paid your fee, you're registered with the city, and you have a license to rent that, that particular address. After you get the rental license, you know, because you've done this, it has a number on it. That's your license number. And that's the number that you then have to put into the city's portal in order to get the certificate of rental suitability. Mm -hmm. So the cross check there is not only with whoever collects the money for the rental license, whether it's revenue or L&I, and the, um, the city's L&I compliance area. So those computers all talk now. There was a time not too long ago where they didn't talk. And when you put that license number with the address into the portal for the certificate, it will say, you're clear. You don't have any open violations. We're going to grant you this certificate of rental suitability. But actually, you know what? I'm out of order now because things have changed again. Go back to the beginning. You have to get the lead test so that right. you can get the rental license so that you can get the certificate so that you can put a tenant in there. And that's in every zip code right now, correct? It's yes. all, all Philly. It's for anything post 1978, whether there's children or not. It's irrelevant now. You can't say, well, there were no children. I don't have to get it. And there's a couple other exceptions, educational use and whatever the rest of the list says. But generally, you're renting a, a home or a small apartment building in the city. You need to have that document. Again, unless it was built recently after 1978. That was when we finished with lead paint. So then hopefully you got all those documents before you rent to someone because you are provided to give them a lot of that stuff. I, for my own properties, will full disclose and give them everything. I don't want there to be any issues. I will have them sign and initial everything. I've seen too many things in court where it just goes bad. And if you're ahead of the game, you won't get caught short. So every new tenant has to get a, a newly pulled rental suitability? It depends. So there's there's a time frame on the certificate. Don't forget, when you pull the certificate, it has a date on it. The start date, and then it's 90 days or 60 days. I'm, I'm lost in the mm -hmm. document dates a little bit. Uh, I usually have them in front of me. Um, so whatever that time period is, is when it's good. So if you got it, January 1st, and it's good till the end of March. If you turned that property over in that time period and the dates were still good, you wouldn't have to pull a new one mm -hmm. because okay. it would be within your window. If it's outside the window, then you're going to have to get a new one. Okay. Because in any case, it's free and it's you just do it online. So it's not a big deal. You just have to correct. remember to do it. Now, it's important, though, to have it before there's a problem. Because remember, at that point, the city believes that you are compliant with any violations and the property's habitable. But once you put a tenant in there and they control the property and you don't have a certificate, a lot of things happen. They could not let you in. They could damage the property because they know if you get that document, you're going to evict them. They also know if you're getting that document after you're in there, that they don't have to pay any rent for that time period. So this is pretty important. We should probably stop here 
talk about that. If you don't have a certificate, you are not allowed to collect rent. If you don't have a booklet, a, a rental license, you are not allowed to collect rent. If you did collect it during the time where you weren't compliant, the law says you can keep it. So there's a case called Goldstein versus Wiener litigated a few years ago where the tenant tried to sue for the rent that they paid during a time where the landlord didn't have a license. And the court said, look, we understand that you don't have to pay rent when there's no license. But if you did pay rent when there was no license, you're not allowed to get it back. Okay. Which is different than what the lead law says. So the lead law says, if you paid rent during a time where there was no lead certificate, you are allowed as a tenant to sue for all the rent that you paid during the non-compliant time for the owner. I'll say that again. If you rented a property without a lead certificate and the tenant paid rent, let's say it's $1,000 a month, they paid for a year. So landlord collects $12,000 worth of rent, but with no lead certificate. Tenant finds out there was no lead certificate or they stopped paying after they paid the 12,000 and now the landlord wants to evict, goes to somebody like me, we say, where's your lead certificate? They say, I don't have one. We say, go get one. So now you ring the bell for the tenant by going in there to get a lead test. And they go, well, wait a minute, you're getting it now. I've been here for a year. They then start sniffing around and they find out that they can sue. The tenant can sue the landlord for all the rent that they've paid during the period of noncompliance. So that 12000 in this example would be actionable by the tenant against the landlord. In addition to that, the tenant is allowed to sue for attorney's fees and punitive damages up to $2,000. So imagine that you've collected your rent for a year, you got $12,000 in your pocket, and all of a sudden you're getting sued for the $12,000 plus some lawyer's fee plus $2,000, all because you didn't get that piece of paper. So I guess I could see where maybe that was happening, but today, since we can't move forward with getting our rental license without having the lead certification uploaded to whatever portal they've created for that, then are we kind of safe? Because if we have a rental license, that means that we did do our lead testing. In theory, you're right. It, it's one of those things that should die down once it cycles through, like everything okay. else. Mm -hmm. They figure it, it out, it cycles through. But now I see it as a defense that a lot of the community legal service type lawyers are using by filing a proactive case on behalf of the tenants because they didn't have the certificate. It's a problem. Okay. So, and would, do you know, is Philadelphia have more, um, more of this kind of activist, activist groups that are helping tenants to find these loopholes? It's much more aggressive in Philly. It exists in the counties and, and some of the counties that I visited did have lawyers available in the courtroom on the day of hearings. That's not the same now as much. But it still exists. And there are agencies available for tenants to find if they want to. And it's all sent to them. With the complaint, there's a list of agencies and people they can call to help them. In Philly, when they walk into the room, they're bombarded by people and announcements and pronouncements of who's available. There's a, a courtroom navigator that's available to answer questions and direct them to the lawyers. There's three or four different agencies that are there on a regular basis to take on free legal work for tenants. Okay. It, it has so, definitely shifted to a, a tenant-based mm -hmm. room now. Okay, that's interesting. So I want to kind of put a pin on that and finish. Let's finish with what the, I sorry, I interrupted, but finish with the paperwork that's required. What do I need to go into court with to make sure that I've done everything right and can't be caught on just some technicality or you know missing some paperwork and then sure. get back to what the at kind of the the tenant culture and and what in reality is really like to go to if to eviction with a tenant 
Sure. So we've got the, the rental license, the certificate, the lead cert. Those are the big ones. You're always going to have a lease. If there's utility bills, you should have the bills. Other than that, the next step in the process for us as of January 2022 is now diversion. So the, the free lawyers, the community legal services, the tenant advocates, they've all decided that the impact of an eviction on a tenant's record is catastrophic to their future. And so what they've now tried and maybe successfully to do is to divert cases from court. What does that mean? It means that before you can file an eviction in landlord tenant court in Philadelphia, for any reason other than threats of violence, you must first prepare a letter that goes to the tenant via uh, regular mail with proof of mailing. Once that is done, it's uploaded to a portal that the city set up where you are inputting tenant information and the, the proof of the mailing of the letter and a ledger. And you're telling them why you want to evict them. They then, the city, this agency, has 30 days to decide what to do. Is there going to be a mediation? Does the tenant want a mediation? Are we going to set this up with a housing counselor and have a little conference? Or are we just going to wait 30 days while the tenant maybe tries to reach out to me or the owner, tries to make their own deal? Or are we going to go to court? But nothing can happen for those first 30 days. So that's delay number one. Then uh, we've seen uh, the number of cases per day that the Philly courts are taking shrink. Pre-COVID versus post-COVID, the numbers have gone down considerably. The slots that are available to go to court are less, which makes it longer to get to court. So what used to be 22, 23 days is now somewhere in the 45 to 60 day range. So and is that after, an intentional way of slowing things down or a manpower issue? It's not a manpower issue. It may be a health issue because when they first opened the courts, there were eight slots of six people in the room at a time. And... And that took the number to a total of about 48 a day. There used to be 80 in the morning and 40 in the afternoon. So we've never really gotten back to full capacity. That's a function of the times. Is it a function of health? Is it manpower? I really don't know. I'm not privy to those decisions. But I can tell you that because there are less slots, it takes longer to get one. And so okay. they've stretched out the amount of time that it takes to get to court. And then the landlord tenant officer who comes in at the end to actually perfect the lockout, the eviction, they're limited. So they used to have many more slots and people than they have now. And they have fewer per day, which means it takes longer to get one. So when we see that pre-COVID rate, the, the rates of uh, evictions were somewhere around 2000 and now they're much lower. It's not a function of things getting better in the city. It seems like it's more a function of things being slowed down by how they work. And that, that would takes... be true. The other mm -hmm. thing that my colleagues on the community legal side would tell you that there's less evictions because the diversion is working. There's okay. less cases going to court because they're diverted out of the system. They have their statistics that would confirm that. So whether you watch Fox News or MSNBC, you get news, right? So depending on how you look at your numbers, you could say it's a success or you could say it's not. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit about what diversion is like and what really happens? Diversion is interesting. It, I believe, again, without any concrete knowledge, that certain cases are pushed in and certain cases are pushed out. By that, I mean, 
if I put in a case for diversion where a tenant owes $10,000, if they have limited availability for mediators and housing counselors, they're not going to do so well with a $10,000 debt in a non-binding mediation as they might with a $2,000 debt because the likelihood of a landlord agreeing to a few payments for $2,000 out of court is probably greater than a landlord agreeing to payments that could take quite some time to recoup a $10,000 debt. So I think that you will only see certain types of cases make it through diversion at all. And those people, for whatever, however, whatever they do, they come up with the money. I, I can't tell you, Cheryl, how many times everybody has started a new job. When I sit with them, I'm starting a new job. I'll have a check in two weeks. So maybe the world is opening up. Maybe more people are working. Maybe they got off the couch and decided it's time to finally get a job to pay my bills. I don't know. Um, but the actual reason why the cases are down could be the push from month to month until it's a new year and you see less of them. It could be that the diversion is working. It could be a combination of all of those things. I, I see the numbers, the monthly rent going up. I see the amount of debt that landlords are seeking going up. So I don't know if landlords are waiting longer to file. I don't know if they think they can't file, if there are still people out there who say, I didn't know everything was back to normal-ish to do this. I really don't know. Okay. I'd only be guessing. I so, well, it does seem from, from the exposure I've had to landlords, um, from, you know, from running the group and just being out there is that people do, for some reason, they wait, um, a lot of say newer landlords or unprofessional landlords seem to have more of an attitude of like, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be the bad guy. Um, I, you know, they told me that they're going to pay me next week, so I'll give them a chance and and that kind of thing. Um, I'm the last person to say, you know, don't give people a chance and everybody, you know, runs into hard times. But it does seem something that I've noticed as I've um, been a investor for, for several years is that in providing housing, there's a different attitude. Like if you own a supermarket, you don't, you know, people don't come to the cashier and say, oh, like, you know, I really want all this food. I don't have the money with me. I'll be back tomorrow. I'll be back next week. We're good, right? And you know, it just doesn't work that way, fortunately or unfortunately. And in housing, there does seem to be the, the uh, say, semi-professional or amateur <laughs> landlord who who does that. Um, so do do you see like among your clients are um well let let me ask it a different way what what do i ideally need to do as a landlord first of all we talked about the paperwork i need to have all my paperwork in line um my tenants stopped paying so in the 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 ideal world what's the process that i go through as soon as you know Day one, tenant is paying late. Do I file? Um, some people wait because it is expensive to, to, or they think or fear that it's going to be expensive to, to start the court process. So ideally, in order to minimize my loss, what do question. I want to do? Great question. So first, you have to decide what your business model is, what your uh, slush fund is, what you can handle if a tenant doesn't pay. I've seen too many times where someone buys a property with the expectation that it's always going to be full, the tenant's always going to pay, mm -hmm. and there's never going to be repairs. Uh, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> I wish. So if that is your mindset, you're going to be terribly disappointed from the beginning. And then you're going to get hostile with the tenant very quickly. And then that relationship is going to deteriorate very quickly. Versus it's a business. 
You have to treat it as a business. You have to be prepared for bad days and good days. You have to have some money set aside for repairs because you have to make the repairs. You have to keep the property habitable. And if you do those things, the relationship can change as well. If your expectations are in line with reality and you have a real conversation with the tenant at the beginning, I think you can have a different relationship than what I see on a daily basis. Like I said, I own a number of properties. I have leases in a drawer that I don't look at. They don't bother me. I don't bother them. If they have a complaint, we fix it. If rent's not due, they get a letter. We have an understanding. I don't raise rents a lot because it covers what I need it to cover. And, and I have tenants that are with me 10 and 15 years because we've established that rapport. If a tenant feels taken advantage of, they're going to put their back against the wall and they're going to get hostile. And if a landlord waits too long, they're sending a message to the tenant that you really don't care about any of this and you'll get to me when I get to you and we'll get to each other and we'll do whatever we do. So if you have a policy that rents due by the fifth, if I don't have it by the fifth on the sixth day, I'm sending an email or whatever you decide is your policy. If I don't have it by the 10th, I pull the trigger. But the problem with pulling the trigger and calling somebody like me is there is an expense to it. But my argument is, is it worth the three or four months of back and forth with the stories from a tenant that they're going to pay you on Tuesday like Wimpy does? Or are you going to eat my costs early because it's less than the rents that you're losing and you're going to get control over your situation faster? People often say, oh, you know, your fees, they're too high. And I say, well, how much is your rent? I'm less than a month's rent. Isn't that worth getting into the game early when your lease says that the tenant has to reimburse you the legal fees anyway? You're, you're laying it out. But if the tenant's going to stay, the tenant's going to pay or you're going to evict them because they didn't pay the fees and costs. Right. So it's effective. It also... It teaches a mindset to the tenant that there is not a lot of room and I can't sell these stories very long because they're on to me. They're not going to let me put them off and then the car breaks down and then, you know, the daycare and the COVID and all the other stories that come along from a tenant side. Are there real things that happen to tenants? Sure. Do, do tenants run into bad luck a lot? Yeah, they do. It's communication, though. Like these diversion calls that we get in our office, the tenant says, I got a letter that says I'm supposed to call you. And my first question to them is, did you ever call your landlord? Did you ever say, I'm going to be late with the rent. I can't afford my $1,400, but I'll give you $500. Mm -hmm. Can I work with you? Can I show you that I'm trying? I'll do something and we'll figure it out. But the tenants, they go silent. And then what are you supposed to do? Right. And then I have landlords that feel bad. I get that a lot. I feel bad for them. And I say, well, then you're in the wrong business. Because unless you're <laughs> adopting these people, you got to feed your kids first, then help the tenant if you want. But this is not a benevolent association. It's not a freebie. You're not giving them the house. And if you are, great, if that's your model, but you got to stay on top of this. It's a business that deserves to have the fee paid. And I say to tenants all the time, do you go to a restaurant, like you said earlier, do you go to the restaurant and say, oh, that was a great meal. I'll pay for it tomorrow and walk out. No, you don't do that. You pay the bill when it's due. And then I've had people that say to me uh, in court, I had to fix my car. I used the rent money to pay for my car. Because if I don't have the car, I can't drive to work. And if I can't drive to work, I'll never be able to pay because I'll lose my job. And I say, okay, well, maybe that's reasonable. But did you tell your landlord that? No, we don't talk. Okay. So some of this is open communication. Some of it is the luck of the draw. And I always remind my clients, I didn't pick your tenant. You did. 
So there was something that made you think this person was okay at some point. See if you can get back to that point. Because I do talk people out of hiring me on occasion. It's just, you don't need me right now. Go back mm-hmm. and, and try to work it out. If you need me, I'm here. But like I had one guy come in the office last week and he said, my rent is $1,600 a month. This is a landlord. I wanted to raise it to 1900 But the security deposit in the last month are each 1600 So when I was asking for the increase, I was also asking for the increase of the extra for the security in the last month. So the tenant said, well, look, I'll pay the 1900 but I can't afford the extra 600 the 300 for the last month and the 300 for the security. Can we just keep that the way it is and I'll pay the 1900 So he comes into my office to see what his options are. Can he evict this person because this extra 600 bucks? And I said, do they owe you any money? He said, no. Are they a good pay? He said, well, they're a little slow, but they pay. So I said, so each month, maybe they're behind a little, but they catch up. He said, yes. What's the the retail for the property that you have? And he said, well, it's a nice twin. It's it's worth $2,100 a month. I'm still undervalued at $1,900. And, and I said, okay, let's go through this. Today, it's January, whatever. If you tell the tenant you're going to evict them because of this $600, bucks, they are not going to pay you in January. You're then going to divert, so you can't do anything in February. Your court date's going to be in April, so no money for March or April. You'll have them out, let's call it June, just for fun. So that's six months at $1,900 a month. You're almost at $12,000 of lost rent over $600. I go, now, even if you raise the rent to $2,100, that delta, the $200 that you're going to make extra, it's going to take you 60 months to break even. Right. Is it worth evicting this person because they don't have the extra 600 bucks? He sits there for a second and he's doing the math in his head and he goes, okay. And he packs up his papers. He says, thank you very much. And he walks out. That was right. the right answer. It's a classic, you know, do you want to be, do you want to be right? Or do you want to be smart? Correct. <laughs> so, well, let's talk about that situation for, for a minute. So you said that in, in your scenario that that tenant would stop paying and then obviously he would be delinquent by the time they got to eviction to the court he'd be owing quite quite a bit of money the tenant that does that isn't th- does he know or isn't he putting himself at risk for ever being able to rent an apartment let alone if he wants to ever buy a, a, a home sure so we're all counting on the fact that tenants care about their their credit um about getting uh you know a um a referral for their next rental or you know being able to buy a home eventually Cheryl I can't tell you how many times I'm in landlord tenant court and I call a tenant's name and they say hey Howard and I go you look familiar have you been here before and they say (laughs) yes you've evicted me before So there are some who care and there are some who don't. Lately, because it's become an issue with future landlords looking at dockets and not renting to people with evictions or credit scores or all of that, tenants are starting to care. So when they call me for diversion, I don't want a judgment is usually how the conversation starts but they haven't paid. And when I say, why haven't you paid? It's any number of stories, but they're still not willing to pay it now, or they don't have the ability to pay it now. So what's a landlord supposed to do? Mm -hmm. How much does a landlord care about the future of these tenants who aren't really cooperating? You know, if, if they're decent people and they wanna make it right, I'll sit with them and make a payment arrangement. And I do that all day. If they don't make the payment, then we're able to to throw them out via the landlord tenant officer. So that's called a judgment by agreement. That's unique to Philadelphia. The counties don't really participate in anything like that. 
it's binding. It's not appealable. So when I'm discussing that with my clients as an option, I tell them it's the best of both worlds. You're either going to get the property back because they're going to breach the agreement, or you're going to get the payments in the time and manner that they've agreed to because they want to stay. And then you're going to get your money plus some of the back rent. So that's always an option. But now you have the community legal service guys attacking you and saying that they want continuances to do more investigation or they're looking at your documents or this late fee wasn't accrued correctly or any number of other things. So it's a battle to even get a judgment against a tenant for the money that they rightfully owe because of all these little loopholes. So I've done everything right. Doesn't matter. And Okay. And the judge is saying, nah, let's give them a little bit of time to find out what you didn't do right. Or <laughs> if it gets to that point, I mean, we have a chance to negotiate with a uh, landlord and tenants and tenant lawyers all together in the back. If we can come up with some solution, we can put it on paper. That becomes a judgment by agreement or an agreement or whatever you want to call it. But the, the tenant lawyers are looking for ways to reduce the tenant's obligation by probing your documents. Everything you submit is of record, and they're looking at everything. When, why a late fee? When a late fee? How much is the water? There was a leak at the property. We're not paying because the, the ceiling fell, or there's a leaky window, or the screen's broken. You know, There's a million different things that come at us on a regular basis. Then, if you can't work it out, you you have the option to go in front of a judge and have a trial. Now, the judges are as unique as landlords, and they all have different philosophies and uh, different rulings. It used to be, in the good old days, I could meet with a client, tell them what the law was, and tell them what was going to happen based on the law. This is your case. This is how it fits. This is what the judge is going to do. It doesn't work like that anymore. There's one judge that won't allow late fees, period. I don't allow late fees. And I've said, judge, it's in the contract. You're now not allowing us to abide by the terms of the contract. I don't care for it. Stop crying. Get out of my room is the answer. Is it right? Probably not. I mean, literally, it's not because it's in the contract. But for whatever philosophical reason, that judge says, I don't like late fees. There are others who will listen to habitability issues differently than others. You know, like everything, the judges all have personalities that they bring to their job. So when a tenant comes to court and says, oh, well, my landlord didn't fix something. So that's why I stopped paying. And but they haven't put their payment into escrow. Do the judges look at that or that's not? Look they at just take, look, which part? Well, if they haven't put rent into escrow. So they said, I'm not paying because uh, I have a dripping faucet. It's one of my first questions on cross. Am I correct? You didn't tell the landlord that the money's in escrow, correct? Is it true that you don't have the money in escrow? Correct. Okay, counsel, move on. What's your next question? Let's talk about the repair problems. So escrow is irrelevant. The case will continue. The issues will be real. Um, the fact that it's L&I alone really isn't the issue. It's more how do the problems impact the habitability of the tenant? How has my life been affected by living in the house with a drippy sink? And, and you can argue it really hasn't. Okay, so the sink drips. If you don't pay for the water, it's irrelevant to you. If you pay for the water, then it's relevant to the water. But, you know, you're still eating, sleeping, doing everything else there. You haven't really been impacted. So the judges wouldn't take too much off for that. But let's say it's a three-bedroom house. And in the back bedroom of an older row home, the ceiling leaks from a bad roof. And the water's pouring into the wall and, you know, the old house is the plasters bu bubbling and mm -hmm. it's now growing mold because the landlord's not doing anything. And the tenant, of course, they don't do anything to the properties. You know, when I started renting, you never called a landlord. You always took care of your issues. Now it's completely the opposite. But let's say that bedroom is now not safe for the child who was supposed to be sleeping in it. 
you've lost some percentage. I could say it's a third because it's one bedroom. I could say it's 20% based on square footage. However you want to figure it out, you've lost use of that property that you've agreed to rent for $1,000 a month. So 20% times 1,000 is you lost $200 a month towards the use of that property. The judge could abate your rent that amount of money until it's fixed. And then off you go from there. So what, like, what are some of, I don't know what to call it, the worst case scenarios? I go in, okay, and I I, I, I like to assume that everybody's, I mean, I, I know there's plenty of people who haven't taken care of their paperwork and done things in that. I don't think there is any excuse for that because the information is out there. Um, if you go into this as a as a business or even as a side hustle, you should be making yourself aware um, of what what the requirements are. But I'm most concerned about the landlords, like myself, like I think most people in 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 the landlords connect group, that have done everything pretty much right, um, and are still afraid that they're going to get into a situation where they can't evict and they're stuck. I mean, it seems like somehow some people get stuck with basically supporting other families. Um, what are these scenarios where people can't manage to to evict or or that it takes an, a ridiculous amount of time? One that comes to mind quickly is the reason for an eviction. So in Pennsylvania, there's three ways to evict. There's non-payment of rent, termination of the term, and a breach of a condition. Non-payment's pretty straightforward. We understand that. Termination of the term, we sort of understand that. The lease is over if it's over, and then you become a holdover. But what if the lease is for a term of a year, and then it renews month to month? Or what if it was mm -hmm. month to month from the beginning? What's your reason for evicting them? Philadelphia enacted a good cause ordinance around 2018 that says, you can't just evict someone because they're ugly. You have to have a valid reason to do so. What's a valid reason? Drugs. I, I guess use wouldn't be enough anymore. So maybe drug sales, uh, threats, disturbances. Um, and then I have to prove it, right? Correct. So the burden is on the landlord to prove those things. And the city has said, look, if a landlord's going to try to terminate a lease for good cause, we're going to involve the Fair Housing Commission. So if a tenant doesn't agree with the reason that they're being evicted, they can take that letter to Fair Housing and file a complaint that it violates the good cause ordinance. Once you get to Fair Housing, they are behind four to six months. So if Fair Housing accepts a case on behalf of a tenant, whether it's for violations of housing code or this good cause ordinance, they could tie you up now until spring or summer. And in the meantime, the rules in the city say that once fair housing has jurisdiction, they hold it over landlord tenant court. So mm -hmm. you can't evict while there's a pending fair housing anything. So if your notice is not for a good reason, that could stop you in your tracks. You would have to wait. Ultimately, I tell my clients, this is a, more than just a battle, it's a war. And we will eventually get you what you want. It may take jumping through all these mm -hmm. hoops and it may take time, but at the end of the day, there's no ownership interest that the tenant has in a landlord's property. It's the landlord's property to do with as they please within parameters. And if they want it back, eventually they will get it back. So you have to deal with that. So would you maybe, I think this is an ongoing uh, debate, month to month or a year long lease is better. It used to be a no brainer. I would say month to month from the beginning of time, because my theory was if you make it a year, the only person that's being tied down is the landlord. If a tenant wants to move in the middle of the night, what are they going to do? They're going to pack their bags. They're going to load the truck. 
and they're going to move. They don't care if the lease is 10 years long. If they don't want to be there or they can't be there, they're leaving. Now, that has a caveat where if you're in a high rent district, you're Rittenhouse Square now, and you have a $3,000 a month lease, and you have a year term, those people who have assets, who care about their credit, they're not going to pack a truck in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. They're going to feel obligated to stay pursuant to the contract terms because there's jeopardy to them. They will owe the balance of the term. It will affect their credit. They will have to pay it later. So in the, the lower end properties, a year lease didn't seem effective to me. Month to month seemed better because if I as a landlord, and again, this is pre-good cause days, if I as a landlord wanted my property back, I could have given 30 days notice and had you out. No reason needed. Now in today's world, it's probably irrelevant which you pick because you're still going to have the hurdles that you have. And, and the time is the time and the issues are the issues. Mm, okay. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, it came up that someone in, in the group mentioned that they, they feel like they can never get their tenant out in order to, cause they want to rehab their property and they're stuck with them forever, <laughs> as long as they stay and keep paying on a month to month lease. That's kind of so true in the PHA world where those leases are for two years at a time and you really can't do much to get them out. Now, rehabbing a property, that would be one of the enumerated good cause reasons. Mm -hmm. So you could terminate because you want to rehab it because you're either getting ready to sell it or you want to increase market value or whatever you're going to do. Doesn't mean that the tenant is going to go along with that. They're being uprooted. They, they have to move they typically only have what they have in the unit and they they don't want to deal with it. So if that tenant is paying and they're comfortable, they're not going to want to go. I often hear, I want to stay. My kids go to school around the corner. We like the neighbors. We have friends here. And, and I have to remind the tenants that they don't own it. They mm -hmm. are little more than guests in this property. And eventually the landlord is entitled to do with their property as they wish. Right. And if they're going to kick and scream, they're going to kick and scream. So we oftentimes are dealt with um, termination dates for school years, or we, we push them to the summer as a compromise so that they can get the kids into another place before the next school year. That's the biggest reason I see for people not wanting to move. Some um, they just know the rents are low because all of this great stuff that's happening in landlord tenant court has helped push rents higher than they've ever been. And right. so to cash out from their low place to trying to find the new place that's now 50% more, that's hard to do. And so you'll probably see in the future some type of rent control litigation coming out of all this where the the public interest groups are going to try to cap rents so that it doesn't get out of control. Yeah, well, that's a whole nother issue that I'm not going to try to touch on in my personal thoughts and probably what most landlords think about rent control. But um, we all know it. Yeah, I mean, there is so much, and and you know, I knew going into this, there this is a really complex issue. And um, you've actually opened my mind to even more things of just how complicated this is, how important it is to have an attorney. Um, we didn't even touch on that about, you know, landlords who try to go it on their own. Um, from what little I know about doing that, it, it's it's a big risk. Um, and so, I mean, my personal advice to people has always been, um, seek out an attorney who specializes in evictions. Um, I know there's there's several in, in Philadelphia and it's an important, it's really important that you, you know, you can hear in all of the knowledge that you have, Howard, that it's something you really do have to specialize in. There's no doubt about it. Um, is there anything else that uh, you'd like to leave us with that you just think it's important that, that landlords realize about this topic? 
No, you, you've hit on it all. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say we've hit on it all. That there is so much that can be said about this, and and a lot of it is uh, specific to the dispute in question. Because, like that one guy I told you about, he could have filed. It doesn't make sense to me to do it, but mm -hmm. he could have done it because she wasn't going to pay the increases. And there's a lot of situations where you can de-escalate by handling the tenants differently. I have clients that knock on the tenant's door every day. That's not healthy. That's not going to work. And that's just a bad relationship. If you communicate with these people, bad things happen to good people, right? So they're not all terrible. Some of them are but many are just dealt the cards that they're dealt and they're trying to survive and eggs are now $7 a dozen. And you got to <laughs> be cognizant. Yeah, you gotta be cognizant of what's happening on the other side of the table in order to effectively uh, be an advocate for your own position, but at the same time, work towards the common goals. I don't think a lot of these people want to be evicted. Things just happen to them. I talked to a lot of CNAs who lost their patient or their client. Person died. CNAs? A certified okay. nursing assistant. Oh. A lot of the tenants are certified nursing assistants and they work for a client. They're the ones who take care of them on a daily basis at their home. Mm -hmm. But the clients are dying. So they have to wait for the next client. And that takes time. There's others who have... Amazon type jobs where Amazon just laid people off. You know, you don't know what you don't know about these people. They're not all out to get you, but a lot of the tenants are smarter than ever. They understand the rules better perhaps than a lot of landlords do. And they are just holding the landlord's feet to the fire to be compliant with all of the things they have to be compliant with. And if not, they're going to take advantage of that opening. Right. So you, you just you have to do your best to be a, a solid business person for your business. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it makes you think about I mean, there's so many so many ways to take this and to to try to improve um, the way we do business. So, I mean, um, I want to do some episodes on you know how to provide tenants with the information they need to get the assistance that that they can because I think a lot of tenants they end up in trouble and they don't realize or or maybe are embarrassed or whatever to reach out to agencies that that can can help them get through a difficult time to avoid the eviction and even though we're not social workers but you know maybe there's sometimes we're in a position where we can at least uh find you know navigate things for for tenants um but yeah, there's just, there's, you touched on a lot of things that, you know, I would like to um, maybe invite you back in the future to, to expound on, you know, there's everything from how to vet tenants to avoid these circumstances, these kinds of circumstances to having the best kind of lease that, that protects us. Um, a lot, a lot of issues. So um, I really appreciate you coming on board um, and, and giving us your time. Um, can you just tell us how people can reach out to you, the best way to contact you? Uh, office numbers, 215-288-8049. We have a website, evictionsunlimited.com. Okay. And um, all of this will be in the show notes, so it will be great. readily available. I appreciate that. So Thank thanks you. so much. Thanks so much, Howard. Have a great, have a great day, day. And uh, I'll be talking to you soon again, I hope. Thanks so much. Take all care. Right. You Bye -bye. too.